Floaters can seriously affect quality of vision and therefore quality of life, but due to their non-threatening nature, doctors tend to shrug them off a little bit. But surveys actually show that some would be willing to risk losing their vision in the pursuit of eliminating their floaters because they're so bothersome. Today we're focusing on the only treatment option where the floaters can actually be removed from the eye, making it the most likely to get rid of floaters. Yet it has the highest risk of complications of any of the other treatments out there. That would be a vitrectomy, so let's talk about it. Floaters can look like opaque or translucent strings, dots, or clumps. Sometimes it even looks like you're looking through a microscope at a microbe. They're more noticeable when looking at a blank or bright background. And there are a few different kinds of floaters out there. There are actually a lot of underlying causes of floaters. And I have a whole video about that that you can check out. But today we're going to be focusing on the floaters that are related to just normal age related changes. These would be just floaters caused by vitreous cineresis or condensation. So as we age, the vitreous gel inside the eye becomes a little bit more liquefied and it also clumps together the collagen fibers that are inside. Even though the vitreous gel is 99% water, there is some collagen in there among a few other things and it's the collagen clumping together that tends to be the most bothersome in causing these floaters. Plus, as we age and as these vitreous changes continue to happen, it actually leads to something called a posterior vitreous detachment. This is a very common occurrence. Usually the percent likelihood of it happening after age 50 or so is similar to your age. So if you're 65 years old, you have a 65% chance of a posterior vitreous detachment happening. And once it occurs in one eye, it cannot occur in that eye again. So you're likely to only experience it twice in a lifetime. But this particular occurrence, this posterior vitreous detachment, tends to leave people with a large floater and many floaters suddenly. And it's that large floater that tends to be really bothersome. When a posterior vitreous detachment is happening, sometimes someone can experience flashes of light in their vision or changes in their vision. So if you're experiencing anything like that, you should call your doctor right away to make sure that the retina isn't being damaged in the process of this posterior vitreous detaching. When it fully detaches, it tends to leave a large floater, like I was saying, and that's because the optic nerve has a tight attachment of the vitreous to it, and when it pops off, it tends to leave a circular shape of collagen. Often it's clumped together, but sometimes we see a perfect circle. We like to call a Weiss ring, but this floater tends to be the most bothersome because it's fairly close to the retina. So the retina is where everything that we see is focused on. So if it's close to the retina, it's going to be more in focus and therefore more of an issue visually. Also, the optic nerve where this area pops off of is close to the macula and the macula is responsible for our central vision. So the floaters that are going to be most bothersome are close to the macula, the central vision, and also close to the retina. And this is both. So many people tend to be most bothered by this particular floater that occurs often with a posterior vitreous detachment. And during this posterior vitreous detachment, often many floaters show up in addition to that one suddenly, because there are a lot of changes going on in the gel at that period of time. So this natural vitreous cineresis and condensation and this posterior vitreous detachment floater, that's what I'm gonna be focusing on today. The reason it's different to look at this than other conditions is that there are other conditions that are out there that cause floaters, like diabetes causing uh, changes in the retina and changes in the vitreous gel. This can be really complicated and sometimes a vitrectomy, a surgery to remove that gel entirely is necessary as a part of the treatment for the underlying condition. But we're focusing today on just simply floaters, no underlying condition involved. And the reason this is significant is because there's a real balancing act for doctors in the goal 
to do the patient good by ridding them of their symptoms of floaters, but also while doing no harm. And the reason that's important is there's actually a fairly high risk of complications when it comes to removing the gel of the eye. So whereas if you have issues because of diabetes and you already have trouble with your vision because of these underlying issues and a vitrectomy is necessary as part of the treatment, and if complications occur, you know, probably something worse would have occurred if nothing had been done. But when we're talking about these floaters, they're non-progressive. They are non-vision threatening in the sense that they're not going to make vision worse and worse and worse. Yes, they are probably in the way of vision and causing issues. And like I said, sometimes even affecting quality of life, but the act of removing the vitreous gel could actually lead to more serious vision threatening complications, which I'll go over later on in this video. So we really have to decide, is the risk of these complications worth improving the vision? And how do we know if it's going to improve vision in a significant enough way to make it worth the risk? There are some tests and considerations to keep in mind when making this decision in order to know whether the right decision is being made or whether it's just going to be a risk that's not worth taking. Uh, so let's get into it a little bit further. It's a gel that fills the inside of the eye. It would be located here on my model. It really is about two thirds of the eye's volume. So it has takes up a significant amount of space, but it, it doesn't do too much. It's not you know necessary for the eye to be metabolically active. It doesn't have blood vessels in it, or it shouldn't. And um, it, can be removed. It's just a matter of is removing it going to be safe. So let's talk a little bit about what that procedure entails. During a vitrectomy, there are going to be ports that are inserted into the sclera that will allow access for three different instruments to go into the eye during the procedure. One of these instruments is going to be a light source so the surgeon can see well what they're doing. Another will be the vitrector, which is an instrument that simultaneously cuts up the vitreous. Remember, it's not just a liquid, it is a gel and it needs to be cut up. So you can't just suck the whole ball of gel out at once. You have to break it up into little pieces and suck it out. So it breaks it up and sucks it out simultaneously. And then the third probe is going to be inserting saline into the eye in order to help it keep its shape and help make sure that the retina is being pushed against the back of the eye and that the eye doesn't collapse. So these are inserted into the part of the eye called the pars plana. There's no retina here, so you're not risking uh, poking through the retina itself and then causing a retinal hole immediately right then and there, which could lead to serious complications and loss of vision. Um, so there are ways that this surgery is done to minimize risks but it still is a surgery into the back of the eye, so there are definitely risks involved. So this vitreous gel will be replaced by saline usually, and that will slowly be metabolized by the eye and replaced with the aqueous humor, which actually lies in the front part of the eye. After the probes are removed, those wounds are actually self-healing, so no stitches should be necessary. And there are a series of drops that are prescribed in order to reduce inflammation and prevent infection. So you might be wondering why would a vitrectomy be necessary in order to treat floaters? And that's because the vitreous is a pretty unique part of the body. It develops until around age 10 when our eye is the size it's going to be for the rest of our lives and then remains relatively stable through around age 40, though you can have floaters before that age. I certainly do. And as we age, then it starts to further liquefy and condense as we've been talking about. Uh, but the vitreous is no longer created. It's not regenerated or replaced by the body. It just continues to degenerate and lose its structure. And while very small floaters can sometimes be resorbed by the body and they often tend to uh, fall down with gravity and become you know, less present in the visual axis and less likely to cause visual issues. Um, and people do tend to neuroadapt where they just start to kind of learn to ignore their floaters because the brain is pretty good at that. It knows what's important and what to pay attention to. And it helps you to just try to ignore those floaters. But sometimes if they're large or central or dense, it, they're really hard to ignore. And if the floaters don't seem to improve and they've been present 
for more than a year or so and the quality of life is affected, well, we know then that vitreous isn't likely to change for the better and removing it would be one of the options in order to treat the floaters. Now I do talk about some of the other treatments that are available in another video that you can check out, but again, this is really the only way to actually remove the floaters from the eye um, with the higher success rates of improving vision. So let's talk about what those success rates are. Studies show success rates of about 92% with about 86 reporting an improvement in daily life symptoms. So in the studies that followed the subjects for longer, they tend to find reduced satisfaction rates the longer people are followed, closer to about 75%. Satisfaction also tends to be lower in those who had smaller floaters to begin with. You can imagine they're not experiencing that wow factor that others may be experiencing who had really bad floaters to start with before the procedure. There are going to be risks and potential complications with any procedure, particularly one where there are incisions that open up to the inside of the globe of the eye, even though the incisions in this case are quite small. The most common complication of a vitrectomy is cataracts. So cataracts happen in the lens of the eye and normally the lens is well protected inside of the eye, but if there is trauma, a cataract can occur very quickly as opposed to occurring naturally and very slowly with age over many, many decades. So knowing that a cataract can develop with just the slightest trauma to the lens, imagine these instruments just behind the lens manipulating the vitreous. You can see how that may lead to earlier cataract progression. And there are some ways to minimize this risk, which I'll be talking about very soon. The second most common complication of a floaters only vitrectomy would be a retinal tear or even a detachment. You can imagine this retina is tissue paper thin and it's held up against the back of the eye by this vitreous gel. And they're even attached to each other by a thin sort of pseudo membrane. And so manipulating this vitreous can cause some tugging and pulling potentially on the retina, which could lead to popping a hole in the retina. And if a hole or a tear develops in the retina, this vitreous gel and fluid can get behind that um, through the hole and behind the retina and cause the retina to fall forward, which would be a retinal detachment. So a retinal tear or hole or detachment would require very prompt treatment if it were to occur during the procedure to prevent potentially a very significant loss of vision. The percent likelihood of either of these varies a lot depending on the study. And studies that followed people for longer showed higher rates of complications, meaning that these potential risks of vitrectomies could be delayed. So even if you're happy with the initial improvement of vision after a vitrectomy, you may still need to be on the lookout for changes in vision, like sudden flashes of light in your vision that may indicate a retinal issue or blurring of vision, which could mean that cataracts have started to develop more quickly. A good rule of thumb is that any sudden changes in vision should prompt you to see your eye doctor right away because the sooner things are spotted and treated, the better. The incidence of cataracts occurring in those who still have their natural lens varies between about 16% to up to 60% depending on the study. And retinal tears or detachments range from about 7% to 23%. The risk of retinal tears tends to be higher in those who have not yet had that posterior vitreous detachment. And that's because their vitreous is more tightly abutted against the retina. So with the vitreous being manipulated during the procedure, you can imagine it's gonna be more likely that that retina is going to be tugged on, leading to a tear. Other possible but less common complications would include macular edema, which is swelling of the macula, that part of the eye responsible for the central vision. And even once this is treated, sometimes the macula doesn't return to its initial shape and that can lead to some blurring of vision and sometimes distortion or both. There can also be a vitreous hemorrhage where the gel inside of the eye fills with blood and sometimes the body can heal that on its own, but sometimes another procedure may be required in order to 
resolve that issue. And with any surgery that opens up the eye to the outside world, even with the tiniest of incisions, there are risks for infection. And in this case, endophthalmitis is a big concern. That's when bacteria gets inside of the eye. And if this is not treated very rapidly, it can quickly lead to total loss of sight and sometimes require removal of the eye. There are some other potential complications as well, but fortunately there are things that can be done in order to minimize the risk of these complications. So let's talk about those. With time, experience, and technology, the goal is always to improve surgical technique and reduce the risks of damage to the surrounding tissues to reduce risk of short-term and long-term complications. And one of the ways that can be done for this procedure is to use a higher gauge or smaller diameter cannula to make those port incisions. Also, it's been shown that using a vitrector at a higher cut rate reduces the risk of complications as well. And also just removing the core of the vitreous is another way that you can reduce the risk of complications. Now, this is the lens here. This is the back of the eye, which is lined with the retina. And imagine just removing the more central area of the vitreous. You're further away from the back of the lens and less likely to cause complications and cataracts there. And you're further away from this retina here, making you less likely to cause a retinal tear or detachment. This is especially important if there hasn't yet been a posterior vitreous detachment, as we were talking, because if that vitreous is still attached, it's more likely to be tugged on during this procedure. There are some tests that can help you and your doctor determine whether you truly have a vision degrading vitreopathy or floaters that are truly causing a problem or whether they're more so benign and maybe not worth the risk of a surgery. It could help in determining whether this more invasive approach is going to be necessary rather than the sort of wait and see for neuroadaptation and shifting of the floaters with time. That way for those who are really suffering from their floaters, they can know hopefully sooner rather than later whether this procedure will be worth it or necessary for them. And it can also help to prevent an unnecessary procedure in those who might have more of a mild case. Since visual acuity testing and peripheral vision testing that's done during a typical eye exam doesn't necessarily reflect how floaters are affecting vision, there are some other things that can be tested or considered in making this decision. One of those would be a simple vitreous floaters functional questionnaire that a patient can fill out and can give the doctor an idea of how bothersome they are in the person's day-to-day -day life. Contrast sensitivity function can also be measured, and this was an important metric that was studied and was shown to improve in people after their vitrectomy. So it could be a really valid way to determine if the vision is reduced. However, there are other things rather than just floaters that can affect contrast sensitivity. And that would even include cataracts or you've already had cataract surgery but have certain lenses implanted in the eyes. Those can reduce contrast sensitivity as well as corneal opacities um, and other issues inside the eye. So that's something to keep in the back of your mind but contrast sensitivity can be a helpful test in making this decision. A quantitative ultrasound can be done that can help to measure how much of the vitreous is affected by these more dense floaters as opposed to how much of it is still clear. Also reading speed may be a helpful test because that can be reduced because of the presence of floaters. So if you don't have the person's you know, initial reading speed before their floaters started, you might not really know what you're comparing it to. Uh, but something to consider. There are also some images that can be taken, which would include color photography of the retina, which is basically what it looks like when a doctor's looking right into your eye, or an OCT image, which is more of a microscopic, uh, zoomed, zoomed in version. And these can show us whether there are big shadows being cast on the retina. They'll show us more of those floaters that are located in more of the posterior vitreous, you know, more towards the back of the eye. Um, they're not as helpful maybe as the ultrasound, the quantitative ultrasound that will get a better feel for the full vitreous. These just tend to show, yeah, stuff that's towards the back where the image is actually being taken. Um, and there's of course the important evaluation of a doctor with a dilated eye exam. We can see those floaters because we can use our instruments to focus at different depths within the vitreous. And we also tend to see those larger ones. We can locate where they are, how big they are, how dense they are, things like that. So is it worth it? Overall, the satisfaction rates of vitrectomies 
are quite high and the risks of complications can be lowered. And based on the research, there are a few things that can be done that may help to ensure a higher satisfaction rate and lower risk. So is it worth it? Well, overall, the satisfaction rates for vitrectomies are quite high, and based on the research, there are a few things that can be done that may help to ensure a higher satisfaction rate and lower risk. These may be that someone has already had a posterior vitreous detachment, they've already had cataract surgery, but they have no underlying retinal conditions. Also more likely to yield a positive result would be with somebody who has floaters that are more centrally located and dense, causing a greater effect on their quality of life, which would be reflected in a questionnaire, as well as reduced contrast sensitivity and even potentially reduced visual acuity. Though visual acuity is likely to be normal in a lot of cases. Also ways to reduce the risk during the surgery itself would be to use higher gauge or lower diameter incisions, a higher cut rate for the vitrector, and to remove only the core of the vitreous if possible. I would describe this as the perfect scenario, though I doubt everyone is going to fit within this perfect mold and they could still potentially benefit from a vitrectomy. So it, it really is up to the individual to discuss with their doctor, their surgeon, and decide what is going to be the best option for them to eliminate their floaters. Now there can be paradigm shifts as technology improves and surgical techniques improve and complications decrease. So over time, the more aggressive approach of using a vitrectomy for floaters may become more acceptable compared to the more wait and see, observe, conservative, mainstay approach that we've been following. So will this happen? Only time and research will tell. Have you ever considered a vitrectomy? Did you have one and how did you feel about the results? For further discussion about floaters and the pros and cons of monitoring versus treatment options, check out this video here. And I think you'll like this one too. Thank you so much for watching and be sure to subscribe so you don't miss any future videos, eye tips, or new research. I hope to see you again next time.